name is Arthur, and I am an alcoholic. Uh, the theme of this history presentation uh, focuses on the big book. It's publication in 1939 and its 75th anniversary in 2014. It's this year. To start, I'm going to present an illustrated version of a talk that I was very privileged to give at the 2010 International Convention. Its title was uh, Big Book History and Myths. Am I coming through okay? Uh, today's talk has a few added items, but it will be a brief history of the writing of the Big Book. The second part of the presentation is titled Unsung Heroes of the Big Book, and it discusses AA friends and medicine and the clergy who contributed much to the shaping of the Big Book, but get talked about very little in AA. It will also be a combination of history and myths. Carrying the message to a still-suffering alcoholic <coughs> is the primary and single service that gave birth to the AA Fellowship and its first group in Akron, Ohio. AA's co-founders, Bill W. and Dr. Bob, first met in Akron on Mother's Day, May 12, 1935. In late June, Dr. Bob and Bill W. visited Bill D. Of Ak at Akron City Hospital, and he became AA number three. On July 4th, he checked out of the hospital, never to drink again and Akron's group number one, which is AA's first group, marks its beginning as the date that Bill D. left the hospital. Bill W. returned to New York City in August 1935, and he concentrated on getting the New York group established. In late 1935, Hank P., whose big book story is The Unbeliever, and Fitz M., whose big book story is Our Southern Friend, sobered up at Towns Hospital with Bill's help and they are in AA number one and number two for New York, and joined with Bill to form a group. They met at Bill's home at 182 Clinton Street, which also became a halfway house of sorts. In the following years, Hank started AA in New Jersey, and he had a major role in the development of the Big Book. Fitz M. started AA in Washington, D.C., and he helped start AA in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Bob and Bill W. met again in Akron in October 1937. After almost two and a half years, there were still only two groups and about 40 sober members, more than half of them sober for over a year. Now, this was actually a remarkable success story since all the sober members had previously been considered hopeless and beyond any help at all. As a possible way to get new groups established, Bill had ideas for a chain of AA hospitals, paid missionaries, and a book of experience to carry the message to distant places. Dr. Bob liked the book idea, but not the hospitals and paid missionaries. In a meeting of the Akron group at T. Henry Williams' home, Bill's ideas narrowly passed by a single vote. The New York group was much more enthusiastic. This historic milestone marked the decision to write the big book. In April 1938, the writing of the big book began at Honors Dealers, 17 William Street, Newark, New Jersey, and it was the business office of Hank P., Bill wrote draft outlines on legal pads, and he dictated the expanded text to Ruth Hawk, who was then the honors dealer's secretary. Each week, Bill would read the drafts to those who met at his home. And Bill W. was certainly the primary author of the big book in 12 steps, but others did make important contributions, and that's the way Bill wanted it to be. Hank P. is credited with writing the big book, Chapter 10, to employers. This is also mentioned in the book, Pass It On. Sadly, he returned to drinking in April 1940 and never sobered up again. Ruth Hawk, who would later become AA's first national secretary, wrote, If it wasn't for Bill W., the big book would never have been written. And if it wasn't for Hank P., it never would have been published. In June 1938, Bill wrote to Dr. Bob that he had drafted the chapters, There is a Solution, and Bill's Story. Dr. Bob's wife, Ann, was invited to write the chapter portraying the wife of an alcoholic but she declined. As it turned out, the chapter to wives was written by Bill, much to the dismay and hurt of his wife, Lois. Bill also wrote to Dr. Bob, quote, nearly everyone agrees that we should sign the volume Alcoholics Anonymous. What would you think about the formation of a charitable corporation to be called Alcoholics Anonymous? Now, this was almost a year prior to the publication of the book. On July 8, 1938, Dr. Esther L. Richards of the John Hopkins Hospital wrote a very favorable letter to Bill W. regarding two chapters sent to her for review. She suggested 
getting a, quote, number one physician in the alcoholism field to write an introduction. Shortly after, Dr. William D. Silkworth wrote a July 27, 1938 letter of support for use in fundraising for the book. It was incorporated into the chapter of the doctor's opinion, together with extracts from a paper that he wrote, which was later published in the Lancet Medical Journal in July 1939. Dr. Silkworth's name was not added to the doctor's opinion until publication of the second edition big book in 1955. Thing keeps. Prior to its public publication of the big book, the recovery program consisted of six steps passed on to new members by word of mouth. Lacking any written material, the soundness of what was passed on depended upon who was doing the passing on. Different forms of the six steps are in the books, AA Comes of Age, Pass It On, and a July 1953 Grapevine article by Bill W. titled A Fragment of History, which can be found in the book The Language of the Heart. The big book pioneer story, He Sold Himself Short, contains a different form of the six steps recorded by Earl T., founder of AA in Chicago. Dr. Bob was Earl's sponsor, and this variation reflects a more orthodox Oxford group influence that prevailed in the Midwest. The Oxford group did not have anything that they called or considered to be steps. Only the alcoholics in New York and Akron, who were then called the Alcoholic Squad, exclusively practiced the six steps as their spiritual program of recovery. Earl T., by the way, is the member described in the big book chapter of the family afterward as getting drunk again after his wife nagged him about his smoking and drinking coffee. In his 1953 Grapevine article, Bill W. wrote, quote, Though these principles were advocated according to the whim or liking of each of us, and though in Akron and Cleveland they still stuck by the Oxford Group absolutes of honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love, this was the gist of our message to incoming alcoholics up to 1939, when our present 12 steps were put to paper. The 12 steps were actually first put to paper <coughs> in December 1938 at Bill's home at 182 Clinton Street. An approximate reconstruction of the original draft is in the book Pass It On and shown on this slide. Bill claimed it took him about 30 minutes to do it. Wording that was subsequently changed is highlighted in red. Much often heated debate on the wording of the steps continued right up to the publication of the big book. In a 1955 grapevine article titled How AA World Services Grew, Bill W. described the book writing project as one where fierce arguments over the drafts dominated the small fellowship's activities for months on end, and that over time he became much more of an umpire than an author. Bill later wrote that Akron provided, quote, nothing but the warmest support. But in New York, the chapters went through a real mauling and were retyped over and over. New York member Jim B. suggested the phrases, God as we understood him in power greater than ourselves, be added to the steps in basic text. Bill W. wrote, quote, Those expressions as so well known today prove lifesavers for many an alcoholic. Jim B., whose big book story is The Vicious Cycle, started AA in Philadelphia and helped start AA in Baltimore, Maryland, together with Fitz M. 400 manuscript copies were sent out for review in February 1939. The copies only included about half the personal stories and was a total of 164 pages, including the basic text and the stories. The review manuscript copies were returned by March and produced few major changes. A major change did occur, however, when a Montclair, New Jersey psychiatrist, Dr. Howard, suggested toning down the use of you must to we ought or we should, and Dr. Silkworth offered similar advice. Tom Uzell, a friend of Hank P., an editor at Collier's and a member of the New York University faculty, edited the whole manuscript and reduced it to around 400 pages. The cuts came mostly from the personal stories. Hank P. posted almost all the accumulated editing changes to the markup manuscript that would be taken to the printer for publication. Bill W., Hank P., Ruth Hawk, and Dorothy S. of Cleveland drove to Cornwall, New York to deliver the heavily marked up manuscript to the Cornwall Press. When it was presented to the manager, he almost sent them back to type up a clean copy. Hank P. convinced him to accept the manuscript as is, on condition that they would correct galley proofs as they came off the press. And they all checked into a hotel and spent the next several days proofreading galleys. And they did pretty well at it. 
Despite hundreds of handwritten changes made to the markup manuscript, there are only two typographical errors in the first printing first edition big book. There's one misspelled word and one duplicated sentence. 4,730 copies of the first edition were published in April 1939. The printer, Edward Blackwell of the Cornwall Press, was told to use the thickest paper in the shop. The large bulky volume became known as the Big Book, and, the, and it has been called that ever since. In A.A. Comes of Age, Bill W. wrote that the idea behind the thick large paper was to, quote, convince the alcoholic that he was getting his money's worth. <laughs> The book had eight Roman and 400 Arabic numbered pages. The doctor's opinion started as page one, and the basic text ended at page 179, not 164. The foreword to the first edition contains many of the key principles that later shaped the traditions and the AA preamble. The 400-page big book was priced at $3.50, and that would be the equivalent of $57 a copy today. It was a very expensive book for its time. As an example, Margaret Mitchell's 1,000-page novel, Gone with the Wind, was priced at $3 a copy, which would be the equivalent of $49 today. And it sold 50,000 copies on its first day and 2 million after a year. John Steinbeck's 600-page Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, The Grapes of Wrath, was priced at $2.75. That would be $45 today. And it was the best-selling book of 1939. 430,000 copies were printed by February 1940. The second edition Big Book was introduced 16 years after the first edition at the historic 1955 International Convention in St. Louis. 21 years later, the 1976 conference approved publication of the third edition. 25 years after the third edition, the 2001 conference approved the publication of the fourth edition. In 1985, it was discovered that the United States copyright to the first edition Big Book expired in April 1967 and was not renewed. It was also discovered that the United States copyright for the second edition had lapsed in 1983. Now, the copyright is still in force outside the United States under international treaty agreement. Now, that was an abridged version of the making of the Big Book. And next, I'm going to discuss the four published editions and cover a number of errors and myths. Many AA members believe that the basic text of the Big Book has never been changed and that it will require three-quarters of the groups to approve a change. Both these notions are not true. Quite a few changes have been made to the Big Book text over the years to reflect the growth in the membership and in groups. Footnotes have been added and wording changes were made as well. For example, in 1947, the 11th printing of the first edition, the term ex-alcoholic was replaced by the terms ex-problem drinker or non-drinker. Several websites have tables detailing all the basic text wording changes from edition to edition. Now, there's an old adage that says, to err is human. And in the next several slides, I'll cover just how human we alcoholics can be. The basic text of the Big Book is, for the most part, protected from radical change by the prevailing sentiment of the AA Fellowship as a whole. Changes to the basic text can be made by conference advisory action, but it's doubtful that they would get very far. The granddaddy of all Big Book changes has been Step 12, and it's happened twice, something that would be virtually impossible to do today. In March 1941, almost two years after the first printing, the wording of Step 12 was changed in the second printing. The term spiritual experience was changed to spiritual awakening, and the term as the result of these steps was changed to as the result of those steps. The spiritual experience appendix was added, and we'll speak more to it a little later on. Father Edward Dowling expressed his dissatisfaction with the change to Step 12 in his address to the 1955 International Convention, and it can be found in the book A.A. Comes of Age. And this is the only reference in A.A. literature to the change. As early as the second edition, I think I'm on the wrong page. As early as the second edition, Bill W. sensed that the fellowship was resistant to changing the basic text and was careful to inform the 1955 conference that the main objective of the second edition was to change the personal stories to better reflect the makeup of the membership. His report to the 1955 General Service Conference stated, quote, Not an iota of the first part of the text dealing with recovery principles has been changed. 
Then Bill went on to renumber the pages of the second edition so that page one began with Bill's story instead of the doctor's opinion. It's not known why he did this, but there has been some very creative and entertaining speculation on the matter. The second edition also had a new appendix containing the short and the long form of the traditions. However, it mistakenly listed the short form version published in the November 1949 grapevine instead of the version published in the 12 and 12 when it was conference approved in 1953. The error was partially corrected in the third printing for Tradition 12 in 1959, but not fully corrected until the sixth printing in 1963. The appendix also erroneously states that the traditions were first published in 1945. They were first published in their long form in the April 1946 grapevine. The wording of Step 12 was changed again in 1957 in the second printing of the second edition. The term as the result of those steps was restored to its original form as the result of these steps. Only one person in the entire history of mankind could pull off something like that, and to protect his anonymity, I'll simply say his last name begins with W. <laughs> Perhaps in a test to see if the membership was paying attention, the third printing of the second edition Big Book was distributed with a dust jacket that said it was the third edition instead of the third printing. The inside of the dust jacket of all printings of the second edition states, of course, the basic text itself, page 1 to page 165, remains substantially unchanged, and it should have said page 164. The first three printings of the second edition big book did not show the printing date sequence on the copyright page, and because of this, it's very easy to assume that you have a first printing second edition, when in fact you might have a second or third printing. The copyright page of the first printing reads Alcoholics Anonymous Publishing Company. The second and third printings read Alcoholics Anonymous Publishing Inc. The dust jacket of the third edition big book erroneously stated that the basic text pages 1 through 164 remains unchanged. Similarly, the original preface to the fourth edition erroneously stated that the first part of this volume describing the AA recovery program has been left untouched in the course of revisions made for the second, third, and fourth editions. Now, this is the way AA myths are born. You print something that is an error and just keep repeating it. The 2006 General Service Conference approved the change to the preface so that it reads largely untouched instead of just untouched. And this was done to correct the erroneous impression that the basic text had not been changed over the prior editions. A similar change was made to the introduction to, to the book Experience, Strength, and Hope. And if most of these changes were not made, the book would read really strange. It would say we're, we're on the verge of having dozens of groups and things along that line. A change was made to the forward to the first edition big book by the 2002 conference concerning a statement that read, quote, Fundamentally, though, the difference between an electronic meeting and the home group around the corner is only one of format. Now, this didn't go over very well with the membership, and the sentence was eliminated by conference advisory action. Several conference advisory actions related to the development of the fourth edition specified that no changes were to be made to the forwards, the basic text, the appendices, and the story, Dr. Bob's Nightmare. They were to remain as is. As it turned out, punctuation changes were made to Dr. Bob's Nightmare. The 2003 conference let the changes stand, and the 2004 conference passed a floor action to restore the original punctuation. In AA Comes of Age, Bill wrote, We had not gone much farther with the text of the book when it was evident that something more was needed. There would have to be a story or a case history section to identify us with a distant reader in a way that the text itself might not. The first edition contained 29 stories to reflect a 1939 U.S. membership of around 100. The second edition contained 37 stories to reflect a 1955 worldwide membership of around 136,000. The third edition contained 43 stories to reflect a 1976 worldwide membership of around 321,000. And the fourth edition contained 42 stories to reflect a 2001 worldwide membership of over 2 million. The story Ace Full 7-Eleven of Akron member Del T was included in the original manuscript but dropped from the first printing. 
A notation on the manuscript pages say that Dell withdrew his story because he, quote, thought the book was a racket. Of the 29 stories in the first edition Big Book, 10 were from the East Coast, 18 from the Midwest, and one from the West Coast. The story section of the first edition, second printing, <coughs> was altered to include four pages titled Now We Are 2000, March 1941. It replaced the story from the West Coast titled Lone Endeavor of Pat C. from California. Pat's story had originally been ghostwritten by Ruth Ha. Pat, who claimed to have sobered up from a manuscript copy of the big book, was invited to New York shortly after the book was printed. He arrived on the bus, unconscious, under the back seat, sleeping off a roaring cross-country drunk. And Pat sobered up again in 1943. AA number three, Bill D. of Akron, is anonymously discussed in the big book chapter of Vision for You. His personal story did not appear in either the original manuscript or first edition big book. The reasons for this are not clear. He was Ohio's panel one delegate to the first General Service Conference in 1951, and Bill W. went to Akron to personally record Bill D.'s story for inclusion in the second edition, which was published in 1955. Sadly, Bill D. died in 1954, prior to publication of his story. An enduring myth in AA is the notion that most of the members whose stories appeared in the first edition Big Book died drunk, and it's not true. The introduction to the second edition story section states, quote, concerning the original 29 case histories, it is a deep satisfaction to record, as of 1955, that 22 have apparently made full recovery from their alcoholism. Now, over 75 percent, or 22 out of 29 of the members whose stories appeared in the first edition were sober as of AA's 20th anniversary on 1955. The stories of 22 members were removed to create a more representative sampling of the cross-section of the AA membership for the second edition Big Book, not because they were either drinking again or had died drunk. The book, Experience, Strength, and Hope, was conference-approved and published in 2002. It allows members to revisit 56 stories that were previously printed in the first three editions of the big book and later replaced. Due to an editing oversight, Jim B.'s story, The Vicious Cycle, was erroneously included in the first printing and removed in the second printing. There are two somewhat sensitive items in the big book that are historically and factually incorrect. One is in Dr. Bob's story, and the other is in the Spiritual Experience Appendix. In his big book story, Dr. Bob briefly describes his three-day binge at an AMA convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Upon his return to Akron, Bill W. helped him through a three-day sobering up period to get ready for a scheduled surgery. Dr. Bob had his last drink on the day of the surgery, and he gives the date as June 10, 1935. AA also marks this date as the beginning of the AA Fellowship. The big book, AA Comes of Age, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, and Pass It On, all erroneously state or imply that the AMA convention began in the first week of June 1935. The AMA archives has long ago confirmed that the convention began in the second week of June 1935, on June 10th, allowing for three-plus days of binging and blacking out, followed by three days of sobering up. Dr. Bob's sober date appears to actually be June 17th and not June 10th. The first edition has a bright multicolored dust jacket that was designed by Ray C., whose big book story is an artist concept. And he began his story with a quotation he attributed to Herbert Spencer, which said, There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. And that principle is contempt prior to an investigation. Racy's story was not included in the second edition Big Book when it was published in 1955. In 1960, the quotation was added to the Spiritual Experience Appendix in the third printing of the second edition. The attribution of the quotation to Spencer is an error. It should be attributed to an English clergyman, author, and college lecturer by the name of William Paley, who lived from 1743 to 1805. 
Herbert Spencer, who lived from 1820 to 1903, was a great rival of his fellow Englishman, Charles Darwin, who was credited with the theory of evolution. However, it was Spencer, not Darwin, who popularized the term evolution, and it was also Spencer who coined the term survival of the fittest. But Spencer did not author the quotation attributed to him in the big book. In this second part of the presentation, I'm going to try to pay tribute to some almost forgotten members of medicine and religion who significantly influenced the big book prior to and during its writing, and I call them the unsung heroes of the big book. Bill W. published the July 1953 Grapevine article titled A Fragment of History, describing the origin of the 12 steps. And he identified the three main channels of inspiration for the 12 steps as William James, the Oxford Group, and Dr. William D. Silkworth. Bill is effectively stating that the collective channels of inspiration for the steps came from non-alcoholics. I'm going to focus on the inspiration provided by William James, the Emmanuel Movement, and the Oxford Group. William James is recognized as the father of American psychology. He was no stranger to alcoholism. His brother Robertson was in and out of asylums all his life for his alcoholism, and he spent his final years with James. As a distinguished Harvard professor, James presented the Gifford Lecture Series on Natural Religion at the University of Aberdeen in Edinburgh, Scotland. His lectures were published in 1902 in a critically acclaimed book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, A Study in Human Nature. James cited exam numerous examples of two styles of spiritual transformation, one gradual and the other sudden and dramatic. Neither was considered superior to the other. Many of his examples were cr chronic alcoholics. Thirty-two years after its publication, a copy of the book was given to Bill W. during his last stay in Towns Hospital. Its influence on Bill and early AA members was significant. James is mentioned twice in the big book by name. The first reference occurs in the chapter, There is a Solution, which was also the first chapter drafted by Bill W. The second is in the big book appendix, Spiritual Experience, which we'll speak to in just a few slides. In AA Comes of Age, Bill W. describes his fourth and last day in Towns Hospital and the remarkable events that followed. Bill, at age 39, was admitted to the hospital on December 11, 1934, and that's Bill's sobriety date. A few days later, Ebby T., who Bill would call his sponsor all his life, visited Bill and told him about the Oxford Group principles. After Ebby left, Bill fell into a deep depression, or what he later called his deflation at death. He had a dramatic spiritual experience after crying out, quote, If there be a God, will he show himself? Fearing that he had gone crazy, he called for Dr. Silkworth, who told him to hang on to what he had experienced because it seemed so much better than what he came into the hospital with. In a lighter vein, Bill and others would later refer to this as his white flash or hot flash experience. It's likely that Bill identified William James as a channel of inspiration for the steps because his book revealed three key points for recovery. The first was a need for complete deflation, or what we today call hitting bottom. The second, an admission of defeat, or what we today call acceptance. And the third was an appeal to a higher power for help, or what we today call surrender. These spiritual principles later formed the basis for steps one, two, and three. Bill studied the book for months on end and encouraged others to read and learn from it. James mentions alcohol and alcoholism quite a bit in the varieties of religious experience, and he cites many examples of al alcoholics going through dramatic spiritual conversion experiences prior to their own recovery. And this was a prime reason the book appealed so much to Bill while he was in Towns Hospital after having his own profound experience. On this, one of the spiritual transformations cited by James was that of Samuel Hopkins Hadley, from 1886 to 1904, Hadley served as superintendent of the Water Street Mission in New York City. And it was at the mission where he had his profound spiritual conversion, thanks to another recovered alcoholic whose story is also cited by James. The Water Street Mission was founded by Jerry McCauley in 1872, and it was the first rescue mission established in the United States, and it marked the beginning of the urban mission movement. 
Rescue missions were later spread across America by the Salvation Army and focused primarily on Skid Row alcoholics. In 1926, Hadley's son Harry joined with the Reverend Sam Shoemaker to establish the Calvary Rescue Mission in the Bowery section of New York City, and it was the place from which Ebby T. carried a message of recovery to Bill W. Hadley was also in charge of the mission when a newly sober Bill W., fresh out of town's hospital, visited there seeking alcoholics to work with. After 10 years of operation, the Calvary Rescue Mission closed in 1936, and it's estimated that over 200,000 homeless men were helped by the mission. Bill W.'s description of his stay in town's hospital and hot flash experience is in the book, uh, It Comes of Age, and he goes into some detail on how the varieties of religious experience significantly influenced him. Bill wrote, quote, Ebby brought me a copy of William James's Varieties of Experience, religious experience. It was difficult reading, but I devoured it. Spiritual experiences, James thought, could transform people. Some were sudden, others came very gradually. But nearly all had the great common denominator of deflation at depth, and that happened to me. And that was Bill. Bill continued to write, Dr. Carl Jung told an Oxford group friend of Ebby's how hopeless his alcoholism was, and Dr. Silkworth passed the same sentence on me. Ebby, also an alcoholic, handed me the identical dose. On Dr. Silkworth's say-so alone, I would never have completely accepted the verdict. But when Ebby came along and one alcoholic began to talk to another, that clinched it. Bill finally wrote, quote, I envisioned the chain reaction among alcoholics, one carrying this message and these principles to the next. More than I could ever want anything else, I knew that I wanted to work with other alcoholics. As soon as I was discharged from the hospital, I associated myself with the Oxford Group, and we worked at Sam Shoemaker's Calvary Mission, and also at Towns Hospital. Bill left Towns Hospital on December 18, 1934, and began working with alcoholics. And he and his wife Lois attended Oxford Group meetings at Calvary Hall in Calvary House. After the meetings, Bill and other Oxford Group alcoholics met at Stewart's Cafeteria for fellowship. The Spiritual Experience Appendix was added to the first edition Big Book and the second printing when the wording of Step 12 was changed from Spiritual Awakening to Spiritual Experience. And this was done because many members thought that they had to have a sudden, dramatic spiritual experience similar to what Bill had in Towns Hospital. The term educational variety is attributed to William James in the appendix. However, the book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, does not contain the term. What James stated in his summary of his lecture was, quote, The value of conversion depends not on the process, but on the fruits. These are not superior in sudden conversion. Also, the term deflation at depth, with Bill, which Bill W. attributes to James, cannot be found in the varieties of religious experience. Prior to discussing the Oxford group, I'd like to go through three slides to discuss a movement that introduced big changes into the treatment of alcoholism. And they came into being about two years prior to the Oxford group and formed a link between the medical and spiritual aspects of recovery. In 1906, Episcopal priest Elwood Worcester and Samuel McComb of the Emanuel Church in Boston established the Emanuel class for tuberculosis, which quickly grew into the Emanuel movement, a precursor to Al Alcoholics Anonymous. The church clinic lasted for 23 years, offering medical and psychological services. The primary long-term influence of the movie, however, movement, however, was on the treatment of alcoholism. They introduced the use of spirituality and recovered alcoholics as lay therapists in the treatment of alcoholism. Among the noted lay therapists was Courtney Baylor and Richard Peabody. Baylor originally came to Elwood Worcester for help with his own alcoholism. But he was hired in 1912 and became a lay psychotherapist. He was well known as an expert on alcoholism. In 1919, he published a description of his methods in a book titled Remaking a Man. Worcester retired to the Emanuel Church, hired from the Emanuel Church in 1931, and Baylor arranged for use of a house in Boston, and they formed the Craigie Foundation to continue their counseling work. And we're going to speak again of Baylor just a little bit later on in the presentation. <laughs>
Richard Peabody was a descendant of a wealthy and influential Boston family, and he trained as a lay therapist under Baylor's direction and then set up his own practices, first in Boston and then in New York City. His 1931 book, The Common Sense of Drinking, was dedicated to Baylor, and it became a classic in the field of alcoholism treatment. The book strengthened the concept of alcoholism as an illness and contained the statements, once a drunkard, always a drunkard, and half measures are to no avail. The story of a man of 30 years in the big book chapter, more about alcoholism, reputedly also derived from Peabody's book. Peabody was the first authority to state that there was no cure for alcoholism. His book was a prominent reference source in the early days of AA. Some claim he died of his alcoholism in 1936, although the evidence is not conclusive. Now we'll discuss the Oxford group, whose role in AA is not discussed very much at all. Lutheran minister Frank Bookman attended the Keswick Convention of Evangelicals in England in 1908, and he had a profound conversion experience and helped another attendee to go through the same experience. Returning to the United States, Bookman began working out principles he later applied on a global scale. His evangelical movement was called the First Century Christian Fellowship, and in the 1920s it was renamed to the Oxford Group, and in 1938 renamed again to Moral Rearmament, or MRA. In 2001, MRA was renamed to Initiatives of Change, but today it bears virtually no similarity at all to its early roots. Core Oxford Group principles consisted of the four absolutes of honesty, unselfishness, purity, and love, and they were believed to be derived from Scripture on the Sermon on the Mount. Additionally, the Oxford Group advocated something called the five C's of con confidence, confession, conviction, conversion, and continuance, and they had something called the five procedures. One, give in to God. Two, listen to God's direction. Three, check guidance. Four, restitution and five, sharing for witness and confession. The Oxford Group gave AA the term sharing, and they were also strong advocates of self-examination, admission of character defects, amends for harm done, and working in service with others. Those principles later strongly influenced the eventual formation of the 12 Steps. In early 1918, Sam Shoemaker met Frank Bookman in Beijing, China, and he too, had a spiritual conversion experience and became a devoted member of Bookman's movement. In 1925, Shoemaker became rector of the Calvary Episcopal Church in New York City and assumed a leadership role in the Oxford Group. The Oxford Group's United States headquarters were set up at Calvary House, a building immediately next to the church. One more accomplishment of Shoemaker, as mentioned earlier, was the founding of the Calvary Rescue Mission. Bill W. wrote a January 1963 Grapevine article on his 1961 exchange of letters with Dr. Carl Jung. The article is in the book, The Language of the Heart. In his first letter, Bill informed Dr. Jung that his past treatment of an alcoholic patient was, quote, the first in the chain of events that led to the founding of AA. Bill went on to relate that Jung's patient found sobriety through the Oxford Group, and this in turn led to his helping another alcoholic, who carried a message of recovery to Bill in 1934. Now, Bill was referring to Roland H. and Ebby T. In 1926, Roland H. was treated by Dr. Jung in Zurich, Switzerland, and he was a patient for about a year, probably less, and sobered up and then returned to drinking. Treated a second time by Jung, Roland was told that there was no medical or psychological hope for an alcoholic of his type that his only hope was a vital spiritual or religious experience, a genuine conversion experience. Roland found sobriety for a time through the spiritual practices of the Oxford Group and was a dedicated Oxford Group member and a prominent member of the Calvary Episcopal Church in New York City. He later moved to Bennington, Vermont, and he had to be hospitalized for his alcoholism again in February and March of 1932, and again from January 1933 to October 1934. He was unable to carry on his business activities. Courtney Baylor became Roland's therapist in 1933 and continued to work with him through 1934. It was under the influence of Baylor's Emanuel Movement Therapy, a combination of spirituality and lay therapy, that Hazard actually began to recover. In 
He was also attending Oxford group meetings, but his family was paying Baylor to be his regular therapist. In his path to recovery, Roland H. was being influenced by both the Oxford group and the Emanuel movement. A.A.'s Oxford group seeds were sown in Akron, Ohio, four years before Bill W. sobered up. Russell Bud Firestone was the son of business tycoon Harvey S. Firestone, Sr. In 1931, Bud was drinking a fifth or more of whiskey a day. James Newton, a Firestone executive and an Oxford group member, introduced Bud to Sam Shoemaker. Bud spiritually surrendered with Shoemaker and was released from his alcohol obsession and joined the Oxford group. Harvey S. Firestone Sr., grateful for the help given to his son Bud, funded an Oxford group conference at Akron's Mayflower Hotel in January of 1933. Firestone and the Reverend Walter Tunks met Frank Bookman and his team at the train station. The event was widely publicized and attracted some notable names in AA history, such as Henrietta Cyberling, T. Henry and Clarence Williams, and Dr. Bob's wife, Anne, who later persuaded Dr. Bob to attend Oxford group meetings as well. In July 1934, Ebby T. was approached in Manchester, Vermont, by two old drinking friends and now sober Oxford group members, Sebra G. and Shep C., and they informed Ebby of the Oxford group, but he was not quite ready yet to stop drinking. In August, while visiting Roland H.'s home in Bennington, Vermont, Sebra G. learned that because of Ebby T.'s drinking problem, he was facing criminal charges and possible commitment to the Brattleboro Retreat Asylum for the Insane and they decided to make Ebby, quote, a project. Roland and Sebra attended Ebby's trial, and they persuaded the judge, who was Sebra's father, to parole Ebby to their custody. <laughs> While in Vermont, Roland introduced Ebby to the Oxford group and later took him to the Calvary Rescue Mission in New York City. In late November, Ebby, a boyhood friend of both Bill W. and his wife, Lois, heard about Bill's drinking problem and phoned Lois, who invited him over for dinner. Ebby visited Bill W. at his home on 182 Clinton Street and shared his recovery experience in the Oxford group. And this visit is described in the big book chapter, Bill's Story. Lois recalled that Ebby visited several times, once staying for dinner. In March 1935, Henrietta Cyberling, encouraged by her friend Delphine Weber, organized a weekly Oxford group meeting at the home of T. Henry and Clarence Williams, and it was started specifically to help Dr. Bob with his drinking. Dr. Bob later began to confess openly about his drinking, but could not stop, no matter how much or how hard he tried. Oxford group meetings continued at the Williams house until 1954. After a few months of having no success in sobering up other alcoholics, Bill W. Became, came very close to giving up on his efforts. However, his wife Lois reminded him that he was staying sober because of his working with others. In April 1935, Bill had a talk with Dr. Silkworth, who advised him to stop preaching about his hot flash experience and hit the alcoholics hard with the medical view on alcoholism. Silkworth advised Bill to break down the strong egos of alcoholics by telling them about the obsession that condemned them to drink and the allergy that condemned them to go mad or die. It would then be so much easier to get them to accept the spiritual solution. Bill returned to Wall Street and he met Howard Tompkins, who was involved in a proxy fight for control of the National Rubber Machinery Company in Akron, Ohio. Bill went to Akron in May 1935, but the proxy fight was quickly lost. In poor spirits and tempted to enter their hotel bar, Bill realized he needed another alcoholic. He phoned clergy members listed on the hotel lobby directory, and he reached the Reverend Walter Tunks. Reverend Tunks referred Bill to Oxford Group member Norman Shepard, who then referred Bill to Henrietta Cyberling. Bill contacted her by phone and introduced himself as, quote, a member of the Oxford Group and a rum hound from New York. Henrietta invited him to meet that afternoon at her gatehouse at Stan Hewitt Hall on the Cyberling Estate, and she viewed Bill's arrival as her answer to her prayers for Dr. Bob and called Ann Smith to arrange a dinner the next day. On Mother's Day, May 12, 1935, Bill W., who was age 39, met Dr. Bob, who was age 55, at Henrietta Cyberling's gatehouse. Dr. Bob was so badly hungover that he couldn't eat dinner, and he planned to stay only 15 minutes. Privately, Bill told Dr. Bob of his alcoholism experience in the manner suggested by Dr. Silkworth. 
Dr. Bob then opened up, and he and Bill talked until after 11 p.m. Dr. Bob's planned 15 minutes turned into six hours. Bill moved to Dr. Bob's house in early June, and they all went to Oxford group meetings at the home of T. Henry and Clara Williams. Now, on June 1936, Oxford group global popularity was at its height. 10,000 people flocked to the Berkshires for a meeting at Stockbridge, Massachusetts. An Oxford Group house party, which was a cross between a convention and a retreat, in Birmingham, England, drew 15,000. On August 26th, Frank Bookman and the Oxford Group experienced a public relations disaster. A New York World Telegram article by William H. Burney quoted Bookman as saying, quote, I thank heaven for a man like Adolf Hitler who built a front line of defense against the Antichrist of Communism. Although taken out of context, it plagued Bookman's reputation for years, and it marked the beginning of the decline of the Oxford Group. In April 1937, Ebby T. got drunk after two years and seven months of sobriety, and it began an on-again, off-again pattern of drinking and sobriety that would stay with Ebby. During their early years, the Akron and New York groups were directly affiliated with the Oxford Group. It was helpful at first, but eventually produced problems. In the spring of 1937, leaders of the Oxford Group in New York City ordered alcoholics staying at the Calvary Rescue Mission not to attend meetings at Bill W.'s home. Bill and Lois were criticized for having, quote, drunks-only meetings at their homes and described as, quote, not maximum, and that was an Oxford Group term for those lagging in their devotion to Oxford Group principles. In August 1937, Bill and Lois stopped attending Oxford Group meetings, and the New York AA separated from the Oxford Group. Now, this was the beginning of AA separating itself from outside affiliation, and it set the groundwork for what would later become Tradition 6. The Akron Group remained affiliated with the Oxford Group for two more years. Nations of the world armed for World War II, and Frank Bookman called for a, quote, moral and spiritual rearmament to address the root causes of the conflict. He renamed the Oxford Group to Moral Rearmament, or MRA. Another factor influencing the renaming was that Bookman's Hitler remark caused Oxford University to request that its name stop being used by the movement. On May 10, 1939, led by pioneer member Clarence S., whose big book story is Home Brewmeister, the Cleveland members announced that they would meet separately from Akron and the Oxford group. Their first meeting was at the home of Abby G., whose big book story is He Thought He Could Drink Like a Gentleman. After almost four years, this was AA's third group. Clarence S. claimed that it was the first group to call itself Alcoholics Anonymous. However, the term was used a number of times in letters by Bill W. to describe meetings held at his home almost a year prior to the founding of the Cleveland group. In late October 1939, Akron members of the Alcoholic Squad withdrew from the Oxford group and held meetings at Dr. Bob's house. And it was a painful separation due to the great affection that they had towards T. Henry and Clarence, Will Clarence Williams. The founding of the Cleveland Group and this action by the Akron Group ended all outside affiliation between the AA Fellowship and the Oxford Group or anyone else. In a July 14, 1949 letter to the Reverend Sam Shoemaker, Bill W. wrote, quote, so far as I am concerned, and Dr. Smith too, the Oxford group seated AA. It was our spiritual wellspring at the beginning. Bill later wrote in AA Comes of Age, quote, Early AA got its ideas of self-examination, acknowledgement of character defects, restitution for harm done and working with others, straight from the Oxford group and directly from Sam Shoemaker, their former leader in America, and from nowhere else. Bill later regretted not writing to Frank Bookman as well. In the remaining time, I'm going to try to sum up the key role of the big book in AA history and why I believe it enjoys and deserves so much respect and admiration from the AA membership. AA's historic 1955 International Convention in St. Louis introduced a new circle and triangle symbol that was prominently displayed on a large banner draping the back of the stage. In AA Comes of Age, Bill W. described the circle as representing the whole of AA. The triangle represented AA's three legacies of recovery, unity, and service. Each of AA's three legacies has a foundation of 12 spiritual principles. They are the 12 steps for the legacy of recovery, 
the 12 traditions for the legacy of unity, and the 12 concepts for the legacy of service. There's an old saying that hindsight is 2020, and history is hindsight, particularly in searching for cause and effect. The common root action that caused the written evolution of the three legacies of AA very likely took place in October 1937, and it was a group conscience decision by the Akron and New York groups to permit the writing of a book of experience that later came to be fondly known in AA as the Big Book. The book's contents explain the 12 steps in AA's legacy of recovery. The forward to the first edition defines many of the key principles that were later absorbed into the 12 traditions and AA's legacy of unity. And finally, the service structure that was needed to produce and distribute the book and manage public relations and funds related to book sales provided much of the initial experience and organization that later helped shape the 12 concepts and AA's legacy of service. The second edition Big Book introduced a new appendix containing the long and short form of the 12 traditions, and the fourth edition introduced a new appendix containing the short form of the 12 concepts for world service. The Big Book now contains all 36 spiritual principles of AA's three legacies of recovery, unity, and service. The origin and development of the Big Book is singularly unique. As AA's first piece of literature, every AA member at the time of its writing had an opportunity to individually and directly contribute to its wording, and probably did. And this is true of no other piece of AA literature. The Big Book has a remarkable history of carrying the message of recovery throughout the world in the 20th and 21st centuries. 300,000 copies of the first edition were distributed from 1939 to 1955 in 16 printings. 1,150,000 copies of the second edition were distributed from 1955 to 1976, also in 16 printings. 19,550,000 copies of the third edition were distributed from 1976 to 2001 in 34 printings. By 2007, Big Book distribution reached the 28 million mark and is now well exceeding the 30 million mark. And that's just the English language version. Big Book distribution milestones are celebrated with the presentation of a milestone copy to a distinguished recipient. Dis distribution of the Big Book reached the 1 million mark in April 1973 during the span of the second edition. The millionth copy was presented to President Richard Nixon in the White House by Dr. John L. Norris, Chair of the General Service Board of AA, who is affectionately known in AA as Dr. Jack. Distribution of the Big Book reached the 2 million mark in June 1979. The 2 millionth copy was presented to HEW Secretary Joseph Califano by Lois W., and it required only six years for the Big Book distribution to double from 1 to 2 million. Ruth Hock, Bill W.'s first secretary who typed and retyped the original manuscript, was presented with the five millionth copy of the Big Book at the 1985 International Convention in Montreal. Ruth's daughter later revealed that the five millionth copy was actually not given to her that night since it had not been returned from the printer with its special leather cover. A book was borrowed from an attendee for the presentation, and Ruth thought it was quite funny, and she signed the borrowed book and returned it to its author, to her, his, the author. Ruth passed away the following year on May 4, 1986. The 10 millionth copy of the big book was presented to Nell Wing at the 1990 International Convention in Seattle. She was Bill W.'s longtime secretary and the first GSO archivist. The 15 millionth copy of the Big Book was given to Ellie Norris following the 1996 General Service Conference, and she was the widow of past trustee chairman John L. Norris, M.D. The 20 millionth copy of the Big Book was presented to the Al-Anon Family Groups Fellowship at the 2000 International Convention in Minneapolis. Al-Anon is the only other fellowship mentioned in the Big Book. As the new millennium began, AA Worldwide membership was established at approximately 2,100,000. Another membership milestone in the year 2000 was the number of groups, which for the first time surpassed the 100,000 mark. The 25 millionth copy of the Big Book was presented to Warden Jill Brown of San Quentin Prison at the 2005 International Convention in Toronto. 
In 1942, Warden Quentin Duffy of San Quentin Prison pioneered the first AA group behind prison walls. The 30 millionth copy of the big book was presented uh, to the American Medical Association at the 2010 International Convention in San Antonio. The 2013 General Service Conference approved the production of an exact replica of the first edition, first printing big book, and it is exact, including the circus color dust jacket, the red binding with gold embossed titles, the same thickness of the paper that led to the book being named the big book, and two typographical errors. On January 10, 2014, GSO issued a press release titled, quote, Carrying the Message of Hope and Recovery for 75 Years, AA's basic text, Alcoholics Anonymous, reaches another milestone. And what a milestone it is. The last sentence of the long form of Traditional 11 states, There is never need to praise ourselves. We feel it better to let our friends recommend us. Over time, our friends have spoken quite well of us, especially our big book. In 2011, Time Magazine placed the big book on its list of the 100 best and most influential books written since the magazine began, and that was in 1923. In 2012, the Library of Congress designated the big book as one of the 88 books that shaped America. So to conclude... AA's story began with a five months sober and still shaky stockbroker from New York who had his last drink, which was a beer, inside a hospital in December 1934. While on a failed business trip to Akron, Ohio, he met an alcoholic surgeon who desperately wanted to stop drinking, and he had his last drink, a beer outside a hospital, in June 1935. And it's probably safe to say that when AA's co-founders met, they had no idea at all of the fellowship of alcoholics that would evolve from their humble meeting and how that fellowship would save the lives of millions of alcoholics over the next nearly eight decades. Their legacies are today described as recovery, unity, and service. They were our gifts to freely receive, and it's our duty to freely give them away. Thanks to the foresight of Bill and Dr. Bob, AA exists throughout the world today. The big book is printed in 70 different languages. We now also have digital versions of the fourth edition, and it's been a remarkable journey down the road of happy destiny. And that concludes the presentation. I hope you found it both informative and entertaining, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to present it.